have a seat and enjoy the ensemble. That will help smooth out the transitions. Very easy today. And let me, let me share this with you, because we're going to sing How Great Thou Art. You know what I said about having a bad day? If you're having a bad day, if, if you're not having a good morning, you don't have to sing. But if you want to hear this song, and, and you, you want to experience that, then come on up front. Because when this congregation stands up and belts out how great thou art, there is nothing more inspiring than that. And so just let it wash over you. So I truly would invite you to come and just enjoy it if you don't even want to sing it. So I'll, I will, I'll say that and I'll leave that alone. If you end up walking up front just to hear it, God bless you. I'm all for that. Hi, Steph. Good morning. Everybody say good morning to Steph. <laughs> so let's open with a word of prayer and then we will enjoy the prayer and music. Oh, Father God, it is so good to be together this morning. What an amazing and beautiful morning it is. And we know that we have brothers and sisters that are out and about and doing different things. And we pray that your protection is over them, Lord. We pray that the power of your Holy Spirit is within them right now. And we pray that if they are home connecting with us electronically, that the, that the power of your word moves through that medium and into the hearts and minds of all who hear. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you did. We thank you for what you do. We thank you for the promises on which we stand. And we ask very humbly, truthfully, honestly, very humbly, that you would take your place as the pastor and the teacher of this church and lead us in all things, in song, in prayer, and in your word, and in our fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
and if you're able to join us in these great hymns of the church. <laughs> If you'd like to join us up front, if you need a little spiritual healing, just come on up and enjoy this. It's pretty amazing.
by way of teaching. You go and you read the PowerPoint. You know, that sort of thing. He's not that. Jesus is giving us the holistic approach to who God is and who we are and how we all abide together. It's the word we're going to focus on today. But first, we want to go back and look at why this is so important. Let's begin in Ezekiel. And then when we go into, the, before the John scripture, I'm going to go back to even some more Old Testament scripture. And this is from Ezekiel 36. And there are examples of God's Holy Spirit at work, obviously, all throughout scripture. You can pluck them from the Old Testament at will. Therefore, give the people of Israel this message from the Sovereign Lord. Big point of emphasis in this church, the Sovereign Lord. I am bringing you back, but not because you deserve it. I am doing it to protect my holy name on which you brought shame while you were scattered among the nations. I will show how holy my great name is, the name on which you brought shame among the nations. And when I reveal my holiness through you before their very eyes, says the sovereign Lord, then the nations will know that I am the Lord. For I will gather you up from all the nations and bring you home again to your land. This is important to what we're going to preach later. Because Jesus, of course, is the fulfillment of a lot of things. He is also the fulfillment of this connection between us and God. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away, and you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. You've heard that scripture, heart of stone, heart of flesh. A stubborn, stony heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. The only good within me is Christ within me. Everything fits together, right? He is that tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Jesus is going to speak on this in John 15. So remember, right? We're putting it all in here. And you're going to go, whoa, in about half an hour. <laughs> and if you don't, I'll give you your money back. And you will live in Israel, the land I gave your ancestors long ago. You will be my people, and I will be your God. This all ties into who, of course, Jesus is, and the function that he serves in the salvific history of humankind. And we're going to move forward from this into what it means to be the vine and the branches. Okay? But before we do that, let's sing again. One more, How Majestic Is Your Name? It's hymn number 30 in your hymnal, or I'm sure we have words up there on the screen. Would you stand with me, please? <laughs> Big deal 
about uh, his name. And we sing a great deal about the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the name above all names. Now, I'm hoping that we got, did, did he get those, uh, Mark, did he get those four slides in? There we go. We know John 15 is about the vine and the, and the vineyard. We know that it is about the vine and the branches and the gardener and all of those things. You've read it many times before, and you've probably heard many sermons on John 15. But as I always try to do, I want to connect it, right? Jesus didn't teach this in a vacuum. Jesus didn't just come up with this as a brilliant idea. And this idea was not just splashed upon people when he spoke to his disciples on that day. The idea, one of the big motifs in all of scripture is that of farming and in particular the vineyard. We hear a lot about farming. We hear a lot about uh, wheat and chaff. We hear a lot about fig trees. We hear a lot about vineyards. And there are reasons for all of that. We hear a lot, another motif, for example, is shepherding. We hear a lot about shepherds and shepherding and sheep and what shepherds do. And then Jesus comes forth and says, I am the good shepherd. He's the fulfillment of all of those failed shepherds in the past. And every human shepherd that ever was fails. Every human shepherd that ever is fails, even as we Try to walk in God's grace and in God's will. He is the good shepherd. So he's the fulfillment of that. I want you to remember that when we're thinking about the vine and the vineyard. Because this motif, let, I just want to go here. Isaiah 5. And this, I did, this, this. Now I will sing for the one I love. A new song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land, cleared its stones, and planted it with the best vines. In the middle, he built a watchtower and carved a winepress in the nearby rocks. Then he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes that grew were bitter. Now, you people of Jerusalem and Judah, you judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard that I have not already done? When I expected sweet grapes, why did my vineyard give me bitter grapes? Now, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will tear down its hedges and let it be destroyed. I will break down its walls and let the animals trample it. I will make it a wild place where the vines are not pruned and the ground is not hoed, a place overgrown with briars and thorns. I will command the clouds to drop no rain on it. The God, Lord God has planted a vineyard, and who is tending to the vineyard? His chosen people, the Hebrews. How did that work out? Have you read your Old Testament? <laughs> Not so well is the answer. So God has planted the vineyard, and through the law that was given on Mount Sinai, we, he, humans try to tend to this vineyard, and the results are bitter. We have many human shepherds that have walked forward, and you can see some of the big ones out of there. Of course, Moses comes to mind immediately. One failure after another. David, Saul, one failure after another. Let's go through the kings. Let's go through the judges. Let's go through all of the human shepherds of the vineyard. How did it work out? Not so well. The vineyard grew bitter. And so the Lord says, I will tear that all down. And I will make it anew. When left to the devices, this is the, the, the motif that I'm talking about here. And I want you to understand it because understanding John 15, Jesus is going to stand there right in the very first line and say, I am the true grapevine. My father is the gardener. The law is no longer the grapevine. Any human shepherd that I place in front of 
or to tend to this vineyard is not the grapevine. I am the true grapevine. So we see this in the Old Testament. I mean, I have one another, another example. Psalm 80. Come here, Psalm 80. Beginning with verse 14. Come back, we beg you, O God of heaven's army. Look down from heaven and see our plight. Take care of this grapevine that you yourself have planted. This son you have raised for yourself, the Hebrews. For we are chopped up and burned by our enemies. May they perish at the sight of your frown. Strengthen the man you love, the son of your choice. Then we will never abandon you again. Revive us so that we can call on your name once more. Turn us again to yourself, O Lord, God of heaven's armies. Make your face shine down upon us. Only then will we be saved. The calling out in the Psalms for a better way of tending to this vineyard. Can the, is it possible, Lord, You've left us to our own devices, and it has been a mess. Raise up your son. Raise up a better way to tend to this vineyard. So I'm doing this because I want you to see the, the scripture that we're about to dive into for what it is. Oftentimes, and I've preached this before, we look at, the, because we have chapter and verse in our Bibles, we look at it as individual lessons or lesson plans. And they're taught out of sequence, and they're, and they're taught in a vacuum. Meaning that what we're going to teach John 15 today, nothing came before it that's relative to it, and nothing comes after it that's relative to it, and that's not true. John 15, not only is it relative, as I have mentioned, from John 12 to John 17, it is relative to this whole teaching in Scripture. The whole teaching in Scripture that this is God's vineyard. Who will tend to it? How will the power of God and the will of God move into the vineyard so it can grow and produce good fruit? We have a whole history of God, say, investing in man, but maybe, you know, man being set over top charge of this vineyard. Even men after God's own heart like David, who have failed and failed and failed. Let alone the wicked ones, like when we talked about Hezekiah and his father and his son, they had no intention of tending to that vineyard. They have every intention of, of just, you know, reaping it for themselves. So if you go to the next slide, this is what I want you to remember. Right? This is, we're going to go do a little deep dive. We're going to put the ideas in your head, and then when we read the scripture, the scripture is going to preach its own sermon. Because you're going to see this for what it is. The New Testament vineyard, right? The branches thrive. How do the branches thrive? It's God's vineyard. The vine is Jesus Christ, the true grapevine. And the result is we end up in the kingdom of God. And now I can walk around and say, although I may battle with my flesh, although I may need to be intentional with my relationship with God through Jesus Christ, even though I may be, have to be intentional about my thoughts, all of those things that were taught by Paul and Jesus and Peter and John, all of those things are true because I am stuck in this in-between time. There is good within me. As I submit to the king, as I allow his will to be manifest in my life, the only good within me is Christ within me. And so we see that as when Jesus becomes the true grapevine, no more Moses, no more David, no more kings, no more judges, Jesus, no more law. Jesus. And when we talk about who we are, we talk about who we are in Christ. There's a, my, the, the cards for the church over there, right? 
It says, Church Town, Church of God, a congregation in Christ, Christ in congregation. Right? Abide in me, and I shall abide in you. And that's what we're going to get to. So you see what I'm saying? Remember when we talked about how Jesus in Matthew 4, he walked out and said, I am the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is the fulfillment of all these things, of all Old Testament prophecy about who God is and how God will be moving forward in his New Testament church. God is the true grapevine. I work for him. Before Old Testament, I would be trying to hold up the law and administer it to you and make those intermediate sacrifices using the animals that you brought me. Right? But now I work for him. The same as you. And we're all one body. I exercise my gifts. You all exercise your gifts. And it comes together like that. Next slide, please. A couple more points. This makes me insane. Absolutely insane. When I am offered program after program after program about how to make disciples in the world. Program after program after program, some claim, you know, more closely related to Scripture than others, but the idea is that we can have this spiritual boot camp. It's a technique-oriented spiritual boot camp. I, that was the description of a program that I was offered to teach you how to go and make disciples. You know what? Oh, it makes me insane. You want to learn how to make disciples? Read your Bible. Read John 15. And when you leave this place and Christ is in you and you are in him, you are going to be moving through this dark world with the light of Christ, showing Christ, making disciples. How did Jesus make disciples? He preached the truth. He preached that the kingdom of God is at hand. He preached that he is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. We want to beat around every single bush that there is except go out and preach the gospel. I was told recently it's not the, it's not the foremost duty of any pastor to preach the gospel. That is an assumption. That is a huge assumption, Brian, and you can't back it up. Read your... <laughs> this makes me so insane. There are 188 verses about studying God's word in the Bible. 188 times we are told and commanded to study God's word. There are 77 references to teaching God's word in the Bible. There are 46 references to teaching it from one generation to another generation. Every job description that you look, and I hope you're listening, every job description for every pastor that is a legitimate job description, the first and foremost few lines of it are, you must be a faithful servant of Jesus Christ, rightly dividing the word of God for the congregation. If I can't do that, if Christ does not abide in me, and I do not abide in him, and we can't abide in Christ, and he abide in us, all bets are off. Then you know what this is? It's the Church Down Church of God Community Center, and welcome to your Christian-based counseling, at best. Don't tell me it's not the first more, that's an assumption, and my comeback was, no, it's not an assumption, it's the truth. And my reference material, if you want to see it, is the Holy Scriptures. It's not universally accepted. That, that doesn't make it any less true. Oh. It begins and ends with the rock of our salvation. It begins and ends with the truth of the gospel. It begins and ends. If you don't believe that, 
If you don't believe that, first of all, you're not a Christian. If you're not a Christian today, please hear the words that are being preached. And I hope you choose to become a Christian today. I, that is it. That's what it is all about. Otherwise, it is we, the church town community center. Not the church town church of God. I don't think it's rocket science, do you? I don't know. I don't think it is. If it were rocket science, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> okay. So I want you to read John 15 as a discipleship passage. First one, right? We're doing all the preaching up front, and we're going to read John 15, and you're going to be like, whoa, I told you. It's going to happen. So the point one is you're going to read it that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of the, vine, of the vineyard keeper. The only good vineyard, if we're going to follow that motif, that will ever exist is the one that Jesus tends to. And we have a long history, like I said, of humans tending to it. <laughs> Not so good. The second thing I want you to read John 15 for is that it is discipleship. Without John 15, there is no discipleship. Don't hand me some stupid program about how we're supposed to go out and make five points about something and whatever. We go out, we are the gospel. We are Christians. We speak in that way. We live in that way. And if people want to know what we believe, we tell them what we believe and why we believe it. And if you can't do that right now, it's my fault because that's part of my job and my giftings. We need to be able to do that as a church so people can see the truth, hear the truth, understand the truth. Was there a fourth slide? I got all caught up. Is there another one? The cornerstone of the church and of all preaching is God. I shared this. It's the duty of every shepherd to preach this understanding. There is no discipleship outside of life in Christ. So preach the good news. And if you need more references than the 177 that I can give you right now, if you want me to stand here and list them, I'd be happy to have another conversation with you. But nobody will ever hear unless they, people go out and tell them. And that's all over Scripture. So Jesus as the fulfillment, the good grapevine. He is the replacement of the law because he is the fulfillment of the law. He is the replacement of people like David and the Levitical tribe of priests that intervened on behalf of the people. He is the fulfillment of all of those things. Every vineyard Right? The vineyard that God created when he chose the Hebrew people as his chosen portion, it has failed time and time and time again. But by the power of God, this reminds me of Romans 7, oh, what a wretched human being I am. What can save me from all of this? Thank God for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Right? Oh, what a wretched church we are. We've tried in our own strength so many times to do so much good and it's just been a disaster. What can save us from ourselves? Oh, praise God. Thank God for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Him. He can. It's his church. His vineyard. And read it as discipleship. One last thing I want to say when I get to this word. We're going to begin to read John 15 now. In the New Living Translation, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. Boom. That's a powerful statement. And when you understand the rest of your scriptures and all of the references to failed vineyards and failed grapevines before this, when Jesus stands and says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the true gardener. 
boom, that fell on their ears like, like, like Matthew 4, when he said, I am the fulfillment of the law. You're looking at it. These are big statements, gigantic statements. I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. This is where modern translations fail. Because the better word choice is abide in me. And I will abide in you. But you know why it fails in modern translations? Because modern translators, it's a harder concept to understand. So let's dumb it down and make it a little easier to understand. Remaining somewhere is, please, remain in your seats. It's very kind of impersonal. Remain in your seat. You don't need to rest. It's not very relational. You remain somewhere. Remain in me and I will remain in you. It's easier to understand. Abiding is a much more nuanced word, more complex. To abide means to be with, to sojourn or travel with. It means it's a state of being with somebody. It's very relational when Jesus says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. Be with me, walk with me, know me, and I will be with you, walk with you, know you. It's more than just sitting there. Does that make sense? This is why they changed the word. So that preachers like me wouldn't have to sort of give this whole thing about abide. But to abide is to, is to, is to be with in rest. To abide is to be with as one. To abide is to be with in comfort. You know the, your spouses or that those very unique friends that you might have. You guys all probably have friends. They come and they go... It's that special friend. I have one in California. We may not talk for five years. Dave, if you're watching, hi. He sometimes watches. But we may not talk for five years. But when we talk again, it's like the conversation from five years ago just picks right up. We're so comfortable with one another and we begin to talk again. Right? It's, it's like that. So the trend, I looked at all of the translations and guess what? Really, the new... The, King James Version uses abide, but nearly every modern translation uses remain in me, and I will remain in you. But I want you to think of it bigger than that. Abiding is a state of being. Remaining is more of a verb. Remain there. Remain there until I dismiss you. It's more of a verb. Abiding is a state of being. I am with you. You are with me. Okay? So, begging the forgiveness of the translators, I'm going to use that word. Because when you go back to the word that is originally used, the best English word that we can come up with is not remain. It is abide. Verse 4. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitless unless you abide in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not abide in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you, re 
If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you may ask for anything you want, it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Abide in my love. That is one of the most beautiful lines in all of Scripture. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Abide in my love. When you obey my commandments, you abide in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Are you feeling it? Have you, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no long, longer call you slaves or bond servants because my master doesn't confide in his slaves. A master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Since I have told you everything the Father told me, you didn't choose me. I chose you, appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Are you hearing that? The idea of abide, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and you is mentioned 15 times in that passage. This is, a, this is a scripture about being a Christ-filled follower. It's a scripture about how this relationship works. It's a scripture that speaks to us as individuals because you will do no work that glorifies the Father. You can go out and do all the things in the name of churchianity that you want to do, but if you are not abiding in the Father, if you are not led by His Holy Spirit and living in His will, you are not bringing glory to the Father. That is the truth and the reality. The truth and the reality is that Christians and non-Christians alike would like to avoid. Abide in me, and I will abide in you, and ask them for what you want, and it shall be given to you. It's important. You are not a disciple of Christ if you have not a relationship with Christ. What does this relationship look like? Read John 15 again. And read 16 and then read 17. Come Thursday night, we're going to read 17 together. It's going to be beautiful. He goes from preaching love, he goes to preaching hate. And Jesus doesn't preach hate. Yes, he does. Here's proof. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them. This sounds a lot like John chapter 3, where he says, judgment, not, yeah. You're looking at judgment. I have am the fulfillment of the law. You know right from wrong now. Judgment is upon you because you have heard the truth of the word. If I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them no one else could do, they would not be guilty. But as it is, they have seen everything I did, yet they still hate me and my father. This fulfills what is written in their scriptures. They hated me without cause. And then we get to the part where I thought, you probably thought I was going to start with. Because we were talking about the Holy Spirit. But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. If that's not discipleship, then I, I don't have another definition. 
You become a Holy Spirit-filled follower of Jesus Christ, commanded by Jesus Christ to testify about him. What program, what other program do you need? When you are promised the power, when you are promised the words, when you are promised the security of what it means to be a child of God, when you are promised all of those things, yet you do not believe in those promises, you want some sort of man-made program that avoids the Bible and the inconvenient truths that are there. Coffee shop discipleship, friendship discipleship. It's been my experience that if you are in, in the midst of friendship discipleship, there's a lot more of the going out and having coffee part than there is about the discipleship part. Well, I've been discipling this individual for three years. We've been having coffee. Have you told them anything about Jesus? I mean, that sort of thing. fired up for today. Because when we go inside scripture, we learn what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And that, in so doing, we learn what it means the cornerstone of this and every church is that truth. Congregationally, if we are not abiding in Christ, and Christ is not abiding in our fellowship, then we are the church town community center. Come and get some good advice or maybe some Christian-based counsel. If we do abide in Christ and Christ abides in us, then we are the church town church of God. Come and hear the gospel. What did the Ezekiel scripture say? Bring your filthy self in here. And like we all did. Bring your filthy self in here and hear the good news of salvation through Christ. That's the difference. That's the difference. Father, we do thank you for your word today. We thank you for the availability of your word today so that no one needs to go without. Lord, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would open our eyes and open our ears to the truth of your word, that we may read and hear your word, your living word, that we may grow and become the disciples that you see us to be, that we may grow and become the church that you see us to be, only, only by the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to transition into our time of prayer, but I just came to praise the Lord. Normally we would sing this at the beginning, but I think it's very fitting after what we just preached. I just came to praise the Lord. Would you stand with me, please? We move into our time of prayer after this.